My father's nickname for me was the brave one growing up, and he said I was born with a fist up in the air and that I was ready to fight injustice wherever it happened, and usually I was after him. Usually I was like, Dad, you know, uh, that kind of thing. It's, the book is it's about a lot of things. It's about my life, and it's about helping to get people brave, and it's not about me, too. It predates that, but it's, it's, I'm really proud of it. You toured the hardback when it came out last year. Is anything different? one year on as you go around um, venues and speak to people? Very much so. I've, I've, felt, I've met so many survivors and people that now, when it first came out, Me Too was really kicking off. And so most of the questions I was getting was about that, right? And, and my book and my movement, my message is really one of bravery and just trying to be more socially conscious. I think Me Too pushed a great cultural reset on, on the world. But as far as it being attributed to being a movement, I think that makes it sound like there's women in the streets with pitchforks running after men, and that's, that's really not the case. And my book and my message is all about humanity. I'm, I'm pro-men, I'm pro-women, I'm pro-everybody, and I'm pro-us being better. And you talk about in your book um, a series of cults, this cult that you were born into, an extraordinary childhood that you had. You talk about the cult of, of Hollywood and, and you describe it as the way, sort of a story of the way that you fought your way out and you hope that you can inspire other people. Tell us how you fought your way out of the cult of Hollywood. Well, I was doing a movie for Quentin Tarantino and I, it was as if I had this like alarm bell going off in my head saying, wake up, Rose, wake up, Rose. And I was so deeply unhappy in my life and I couldn't figure out um, what it was that was making me unhappy. And I realized it was kind of all of it because I'd adhered to the rules of Hollywood for so long. And those rules are an illusion. And Hollywood gives us a really narrow mirror to view ourselves in. And it's, it's kind of one dimensional, but it affects so many, and it is a form of propaganda. And in what way? Sort of sexism are we talking about? Or sort of... Not just sexism. It's like, here, here's what you are as a man, here's what you are as a woman, here's what you are as a transgender, here's what you are as anything. And the, the problem is, is that it's 96% men in the Directors Guild. Um, that's all the directors, and that statistic hasn't changed since 1946. So it's just a, a very narrow view, and, and it operates, you know, Hollywood operates in secrecy. Not a lot of people know what really goes on there. It's kind of, you know, it's an illusion, really. It's like it's supposed to be glamorous, it's supposed to be all these things. And behind the scenes, it can be really tragic and, and really traumatic. It can also be great, but for me, I was discovered, so I was never trying to be an actress, and, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was a hard road. So do you consider yourself now um, on the outside looking in at that industry. And I'm intrigued as to what you think of the people who are inside that industry. I, I'm definitely on the outside looking in, whereas before I was both a person in society on the outside and also very much on the inside. But I, what do I think about it? I think they're really fear-based and I, I, I wish they'd be braver, but I understand about, why they're about, not. In what way? There's still a lot of stuff that goes on there that hasn't been uncovered. And it's not just about sexual harassment, it's about abuse of power. And, and it, it's about how, you know, that town has flooded Los Angeles, Hollywood, with, with young, beautiful people year after year after year coming to realize their dreams. And my message is one that you, you don't have to be hurt to realize your dreams. You don't need to be degraded to realize your dreams. And I don't have the most respect for Hollywood. I, I, I can't say that I think it's a great place, but I do think since it influences the world so much and it is America's number one export, I do believe it should be better and it's incumbent on itself to be better. And you had first-hand experience of that sexual abuse and that abuse of power in Hollywood. Tell us about that. Well, it was a very traumatic period in my life, and I'm somebody, I, I talk about this in my book, I was homeless when I was 13, I was a runaway, and I was so proud of myself for not getting assaulted when I was on the streets. It's a strange thing to be proud of, but I was very proud of that. And then when I thought my life was changing and getting easier, then it happened to me. And it shouldn't have. I was in the middle of my second film for my attacker, and I know you have to say alleged. Uh, alleged. There we go. Um, but it's true. And, and it, it had disastrous consequences, not just for my career, but for my personal well-being. And it's something that it changes who you are and it steals who you are and who you are meant to be. And it's deeply unfair. You describe uh, Harvey Weinstein in your book, you don't name him. You call him the monster. 
um, it's one chapter of your book, I think, that, that particular point in your life. Um, it's more, you know, your life is much more than that, obviously. But describing him in that way is, why did you take that decision to do that and, and not name him and, and make that distinction? I had help setting up the New York Times article that came out, so I knew he was going to be named. And I didn't want, I didn't want his ugly name in my pretty book. I simply didn't want it there. And, and I've seen him. He's been the monster on my back for so many years. I mean, this is a person who hired ex Mossad agents to steal 125 pages of my book before it came out. There was a million dollar bounty on my book. They infiltrated my life pretending to be sexual assault survivors. It's just so much insanity trying to control what he, his proclivities. I wonder how you feel more than 80 women have accused him, Harvey Weinstein, of, of different things, sexual misconduct. He's currently facing criminal charges on five counts of sexual abuse. As you said, charges he denies. I read an interview with you that said you, you place little faith in the justice system. He's going on trial in New York later this week. Why is that? <sighs> Logic. I feel very rich and powerful people have they do have a different set of rules in the justice system than, than other people do. And, I, and I, I am cautiously optimistic, but very cautiously optimistic. I know what happened. I know he's guilty. And if that's all I'll ever get to have, then that's all I and his other survivors will ever get to have. But it is something at least that he's going to court and that there is public scrutiny involved in this and that, there, that his, his, his crime will be known. In your book, you state that you want to be known as a survivor, not as a victim, and that that is very important to you. But do you still feel that, um, to this day, you're still suffering as a result of abuses that have happened during your life? I know I am suffering to this day, but I also live a great life, you know, but it's been a hard, hard fight to have my own narrative out there because for so long he paid off people in the media to slander me for years and years because I never signed a confidentiality agreement. And so I presented a danger. And for me, it's just been about having a healthy and balanced life while living in a very extraordinary, extreme situation. But when you push at power, power pushes back. Can I ask you about um, the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement? Because you, you make a pretty clear distinction between the two. Um, and it's fair to say that you, the Time's Up movement, you've been pretty critical of um, Lily Livered. Um, <laughs> far too liberal um, actors in Hollywood. Is that something you stand by today and you think that it's two-faced? Is, is that a way to put it? I hope it's not. I hope Time's Up does great work. I don't really know what they have done, but I hope they've done good work. Um, I wish the best for them, and I hope they're brave, and I hope they're not lily-livered, but I, I don't think wearing a bunch of black dresses to the Oscars I don't know if there's any kind of major movement uh, that will be solved by dresses, no. And I think there's, um, again, it's self-policing. And it shouldn't be just the women doing this. It should be everybody. Uh, Me Too, you know, the press really calls it a movement, but I feel that it, it was more of a way for people to communicate. Did this happen to you, Me Too? That's all it really is. And the press kind of made it sound like there's, you know, thousands of women in the streets with pitchforks running after men, and I don't think that's the case. It's not about that. And men get hurt, too. I was going to say, do you think men think that of the movement and are hostile towards it? You know, last night I met a lovely young man. Uh, he was probably about 25, and he said, Thank you, it's changed the way my friends and I talk to each other. So it does have boots on the ground. It's just, a, again, it's a reset. It's to see things through different eyes. It's to see each other as human and not as a gender. And I think we might actually be able to solve this if we can do that. And, you know, wearing black dresses may, as you say, be a PR exercise for some people getting on a bandwagon. But if it raises the profile of, of abuse uh, in whatever form it may take, um, do you think that there is general appetite in society to address these issues? We've seen recent documentaries, for example, into R. Kelly and historic allegations there, which I should say he also is denying. Michael Jackson this week, a two-part documentary, has come out raising questions again about his conduct with, with children uh, when he was still alive. Um, those have got to be positives that have come out of this? They are positive. And, you know, it, it's hard for society. It's hard for me. It's hard for probably, you know, you two to hear this stuff and, and to have your heroes punctured. It's brutal. You know, Michael Jackson was the first poster I ever had on my wall. I love Michael Jackson. But 
we need to have a more nuanced conversation about this. And sometimes growth is, it hurts, you know, when you're little, your legs hurt, but you got taller, right? I think that's kind of what society has been going through. It's, it's a growth spurt. And, and like I said, growth can often be really challenging and ugly. And we have to face the ugliness if we're going to heal this wound in society. I do wonder if any of your events or, or when you're doing activist work, when it comes to things like that, holding um, power to account and particularly accusations of, of sexual abuse with, with all the men that we've mentioned today, there was an article, and this is, you know, I think it's fair to say not a, you know, a major, a majority view, but there is a, a, a real strand of opinion that says allegations are treated as facts these days. Um, Michael Jackson's case, it would lead to his music being banned. And someone writing a piece saying, in the Me Too era, we now presume guilt instead of innocence. If people at talks that you give or that you speak to say that to you, what's your response? I do think there should be due process. Um, and I believe R. Kelly, for instance, is going through that due process. I believe Harvey Weinstein is going through that due process. You know, Michael Jackson is, is dead, so he can't go through that due process. But he did before, and he was declared innocent. You know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's a really, it's a, it's a tough thing. I think the reason there's presumed guilt is because we all know so much of this goes on and that it's not hard to believe, right? That's what's, that's what's so hard about it. But I also think that's not necessarily the healthiest view either. Sometimes when culture shifts, it goes too far in one direction, and then it finds its way to the middle. And I think that's hopefully what we're going to be doing. You think we're, we're on a journey back to the middle? Have we gone too far one way? Is that what you're saying? Or I don't think we've, I don't think we've gone too far. I think it's, it's just scary. I think it scares a lot of people. And it's scary to talk about stuff that society didn't talk about before. And if we did, it was more just, you know, a woman's complaint. But I know so many men who've been abused and hurt, and, and they deserve to have their voice heard too. It's, it's a complex situation. There's no one easy answer, and every situation is different. But I hope that for the people that are out there that do abuse power, they will think differently. I think serial predators are going to be serial predators because I don't think that they have normal brains. But the ones that are the lower level offenders, I hope they'll see their way to a, a better way of being and living. Let's talk about International Women's Day, yeah. which is happening all over the globe today. Uh, their slogan is balance for better. And I just wonder what that represents to you. Well, I suppose balance for better represents equality. I mean, that's really simply what it is. When people, you know, call me a feminist, I'm like, OK, I'm a feminist because I'm not stupid. If you believe in equal pay and equal rights, congratulations, you too are a feminist. That's basically all it really means to me. And, and I think that women, you know, it's been a long road. It's been a long road. But again, I think if women, and they should be celebrated, and I think men should be celebrated, I think everybody should be celebrated. It's nice to have a day, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is. It's nice. Our one day. <laughs>